Welcome to season one of Press the Button. As part of this 10 episode season called Taking Back the Narrative, we are handing back the microphone to members of communities affected by nuclear weapons so they can share their stories and their experiences the way they want them to be told. Today's guests are Trisha Thompson Pritikin and Dr. Yuki Miyamoto. Trisha is a Hanford downwinder and author of the book, The Hanford Plaintiffs. And Dr. Yuki Miyamoto is a professor at DePaul University and second-generation Hiroshima Hibakusha. They discuss the litigation process in both of these cases and the toll this has taken on survivors. So we talked last episode about the wide amount of parallels between the Hanford Downwinders and the Fukushima Daiichi Downwinders, specifically how radiation exposure has caused a spike in illnesses, specifically thyroid-related illnesses. Now, we are going to talk about what this means for those impacted, how their lives have been permanently changed because of the exposure, and what the litigation process has been like. So, what are the widespread health effects of this exposure? And what is the importance of monitoring long-term effects, especially when we're talking about generational impact here? The Hanford Plaintiffs is a collection of 24 stories, mostly primarily from children, people exposed as children to Hanford radiation. It's like holding a mirror up to what's going to happen with the Fukushima Daiichi children. If you read the stories, it's not just I-131 that impacted us. You'll see that... People, almost every one of the people in that book has, in addition to thyroid cancer and thyroid disease, they have autoimmune problems like lupus, MS, they have chronic fatigue, they have digestive issues. Many of them have developed secondary or secondary cancers, which may not be secondary from the thyroid, but just may be separate cancers. The importance of monitoring the Fukushima Daiichi downwinders for long term is huge. We tried to get this to happen for Hanford downwinders. We had something called an exposure subregistry that was going to go along with monitoring. And it was recommended by the ATSDR, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. But it fell through too when the Department of Energy refused to fund it. What that would have done is shown the patterns of health problems in Hanford downwinders for years and years. That's what you got to see because latency periods pass before people get sick. And at Fukushima, they need to continue to monitor, not stop scanning. And they're only scanning for thyroid nodules. I mean, they're not looking at all the other stuff that's happening to these kids and the adults. There are adults there who are sick as well. We can't exclude the adults who are exposed. There are mothers there who are exposed who may now have thyroid nodules or thyroid cancer, who are going to have difficulty with fertility and reproduction. This has got to be the beginning of monitoring, not the end. So just looking at the stories in the book and getting to know all these people, you know, they have many things, not just the effects of I-131. And just to add to what Yuki said, we were told when the Hanford Thyroid Disease Study came about, which was just studying thyroid, as you notice, they always focus only on the thyroid. They say it's the easiest cancer to get over. Well, it killed my father. It's not always easy to get over, you know, but they only focus on that. And so, you know, I just, uh, we were told that there was high incidence of thyroid disease found amongst the people studied because of, get this, overscreening, exactly what they told them in Fukushima. I think they're repeating the very same argument in both locations. And they said, well, if we had, we're just looking for it so hard that we're finding more. You know, that's fascinating. So anyway, I just wanted to say that this is only the beginning of what should happen for the Fukushima Jaiichi Downwinders. And there's a lot more of them than you might know that have been exposed. So, And Yugi, what is the importance to start monitoring long-term effects? And specifically that it's impacted so many young people. I think Trisha's book really gives good examples to people in Fukushima And people are already suffering, but it has been only 12 years compared to Hanford. So we don't know what exactly is coming, but we kind of see what might happen to the people and especially to those young people. So in that sense, the long-term monitoring is crucial. And just a little bit talking about hereditary 
influences or generational impact. Just last year, for the first time in February, the second generation of Nagasaki Hibakusha actually filed a lawsuit against the government that they should be responsible for their health. So now the second generation is realizing their health had been affected. But it's been 78 years, right, since the atomic bombing, although the second generation were not born 78 years ago, but some of them were 77, 76, but the younger ones are in their 40s and 50s. So even the atomic bombing, which took place 70 or over 70 years ago, now people are seeing the generational impact. So we definitely need to see really long, long term. And especially if you think about the uh, nuclides, the radioactive nuclides half-life, plutonium's half-life is 24,000 years, right? So in order for it to be completely safe, 100,000 years is required. So, you know, 10 years is not enough compared to that. No, and I think the parallels are so striking. And unfortunately, it's almost like a history book where you've seen the impact of it in Japan with the atomic bombings. You're now seeing it with Hanford decades after the fact. Now it's just repeating history again. So Trisha, when the Hanford Downwarders litigation was filed, what type of litigation was it? How long did it last? And what was the result of the litigation? Okay, well, the Hanford Down... Winder litigation followed Irene Allen v. U.S., uh, which was the Nevada test site litigation. I just want to mention this because the outcome of that, of the Nevada test site litigation, had an impact on what we were able to do. And they had a wonderful judge, Jenkins, who just spent enormous time trying to understand the nuclear science and the issues and his analysis of what happened and the uh, factors that might have affected people developing some of the diseases they had was intense. And it was a total contrast to our litigation where Judge McDonald, who owned land in the downwind area and did not want, you know, he had a conflict of interest because had we decided there was a lot of radiation around and people were exposed, it would have decreased his land value. So he recused himself eventually but we had to deal with him for a while. But what happened was, it's a little complicated, but Judge Jenkins eventually ruled in favor of some of the plaintiffs who had various cancers, if thyroid cancer, other cancers from Nevada test site fallout. But then the Tenth Circuit, which is a very conservative circuit, came along and reversed his ruling and said that because the conduct of atomic testing fell within the discretionary function of the Federal Tort Claims Act, Plaintiffs could not sue the contractors, which who they had sued. So then the Wagner Amendment came along and was snuck through on a rider to one of the appropriation bills, and it blocked the Nevada test site downloaders from suing because they were now fa- they were removed to federal court. They had to sue the government, and it's impossible to sue the government when you have a sovereign immunity in the way. I know that's a little complicated, but. The reason I want to mention it is that it really affected our ability to get representation in the Hanford Dalmater litigation because a huge firm in Seattle that dealt with personal injury litigation all the time would have taken our case had it not been for this negative outcome in the Nevada test site Dalmater litigation. So it was not only a blow for the Nevada test site Dalmaters, but it was hard on us as well. We're very lucky. We had some very competent, wonderful attorneys who almost sacrificed their homes and their mortgages and everything else to support the litigation. It ran for 25 years. It was mass toxic tort litigation with 5,000 plaintiffs to start. It was called Inree Hanford Nuclear Reservation Litigation or Inree Hanford. And in a massive type, a mass litigation like that, most of the plaintiffs don't even know their attorneys as so many plaintiffs. So it's very impersonal. And it went on and it went on and on because the defense was funded by taxpayer dollars under indemnification agreements signed with the contractors years before. So it was taxpayer money going into the defense and nothing going to us. So we had to have private investors funding us. And we were a bad investment. I mean, the chances of us prevailing were very low. So this went on for 25 years. There were three bellwether, which are representative plaintiffs, three bellwether jury trials 
and two of the three, all three were thyroid cancer plaintiffs, and two of the three were awarded several hundred thousand dollars each. That was the very first time there's been such a jury verdict with regard to a U.S. nuclear weapons production site. In the end, we did not, I was in the second group of bellwethers. I was ready to go to trial in 2015, and instead we settled. And part of it was because our plaintiffs were running out of money. It's very expensive to go to trial, and it's really unfair that we didn't have any funding. The law needs to be changed. You know, the law needs to Price Anderson needs to be amended so to give some funding to both sides to make this a fair litigation, not just to the defense. So we people got thing, something like a couple thousand dollars for cancer. I mean, it's ridiculous. If this had been a case of pesticide or chemical exposure and somebody, and you know, you see these big, big litigation with the tobacco companies and stuff, people get huge, you know, awards because they've lost so much in their life and they have so much pain and suffering. These people are getting a couple thousand dollars each or nothing. If they didn't have a thyroid cancer or one of the few cancers caused by river exposure, they got nothing. So it's very, we did not achieve justice. Just wanted to let you know, it was a sad result. Can I just say thank you for sharing that and raising awareness for something that I don't think people know well enough about. And the point that you made that the defense was being funded through taxpayers, while those who were suing, because it was done to them, had to outsource that. And it's something that we need to talk more about is that advocates like yourself, it becomes a full-time job. And it becomes a full-time job with no benefits, with no pay. And these illnesses have fundamentally changed everyone's lives. And we don't acknowledge that. So thank you for saying that and giving us the awareness. And now, Yuki, what prompted the Fukushima thyroid cancer lawsuit? And were citizens aware of the exposure risk from the reactors at the time in 2011? Right. Actually, lawsuits, especially there are hundreds of lawsuits going on, and one of them is criminal court. But especially I'm focusing on these children with thyroid cancer. And this lawsuit was filed on January 27, 2022. So it's just last year. And the reason why it took people 10 years since the Fukushima nuclear meltdown is because, as I said earlier, people couldn't talk about it. So those patients didn't know who else was suffering. So they thought like, this is just me, I'm suffering, I'm going through, you know. So that's part of the reasons it took them 10 years because some of them were diagnosed as early as 2013. So two years after the meltdown. But because they couldn't talk about it and they were also very concerned, those kids were very thoughtful. And it almost brings tears to my eyes because they were saying, well, we don't want to hurt other people in Fukushima, staying in Fukushima, because if we want, it means the Fukushima is not safe and we might hurt those people. So they are having this conflict in their mind, which is... They are all victims, you know, they don't, and then they are in teens and early 20s. But they were from six years to 16 years old at the time of the meltdown. And now 10 years later, they are in the high teens and early 20s. But unfortunately, so there are six plaintiffs. The trial started with six plaintiffs. And recently, the seventh plaintiff joined. But I don't know much about this seventh plaintiff. So I mainly, let me talk about six initial plaintiffs. So among those six, four had already their cancer come back. And they had already thyroid glands removal, the surgeries and stuff. And one of them had metastasized, the cancer metastasized to lungs. And they are in early 20s. So of course, you can imagine what they had to give up as Trisha was talking about her own experience. They had to drop out the college, you know, because they couldn't just keep going both, like taking very intensive radiation treatment for their cancer and keep going to school. 
And so there are a couple of, uh, let me see, I had the numbers here. One dropped out the college and one quit the job. Uh, so this kind of things really affects their lifetime wages. And on top of that, they have to pay for their medical bills. But then they have a really hard time in securing their own lives, their own occupation and livelihood. So that's a very difficult thing. And also, as Trisha mentioned, you know, thyroid cancer is the easiest one or even the best one among other cancers. I don't think there is no such thing, right? And so, as I said, already five of them out of six are experiencing, underwent some very severe treatment, and still they had recurrence or metastasization. So that is very severe. And altogether, I might have mentioned this before, but altogether last year, 266 were diagnosed. And this year, according to one side, over 300 children so this is definitely not over screening. I'm repeating this point because that's their argument. So that was why one of the websites I provided is 311 Fund for Children with Thyroid Cancer. And this was established especially to support them financially. And this has an English website, English version. So I would strongly encourage people to Take a look at the website. And another one is 311 Fund for Children with Thyroid Cancer, which is 311kikin.org. Uh, but there is another one, which is 311support.net. And this was about the trial. So you can get some trials, updated information. And actually, on June 14th, there will be the sixth oral pleading. And I will be in Japan. I happen to be in Japan during that time. So I'm planning to go, but it seems to be a long trial. And, you know, one of the things which crushed my mind in translating Trisha's book is that it took 24 years and some people just, you know, terminated their lives because of that burden. And so those stories were crushing my mind. It was very hard to translate. But at the same time, this trial, the record of the trial can be a hope for Fukushima people. Of course, forewarning, but at the same time, this can be a hope why they are doing this, you know, why they are, because that's, those are the questions sometimes thrown at them. Why are you suing? You know, why are you doing this? So they are struggling to find a hope, but this book can be a forewarning as well as a hope. I think the situation is quite different between him. This is probably the only thing that I think is really different, is the less stigma in the U.S. Yes, people think it's weird when I say I've been exposed to radiation and all my doctors think I'm a little boop, boop, boop until they read about it and they go, oh, okay, the book has helped very much with credibility, actually. But going through it, it was such a long process that people died along the way. Some of the attorneys died. There was a suicide. As uh, Yuki mentioned, this woman just couldn't wait any longer for the results of this. But it's also, I was so excited about finally being able to tell my story because I thought, if I can go to trial and tell my story, then the news will pick it up and everybody will learn about it. And with the Hanford litigation, one reason that I think that the uh, defense wanted to settle was if you settle, you don't hear the stories. So all they heard was two stories. That's it. Uh, throughout 25 years, 5,000 plaintiffs, they heard two bellwether stories. That's all. Whereas if all the people in my book could have shared their stories, people would have gone, I didn't. I'm getting feedback now that's like, I'm shocked. I had no idea there was so much happened down end of Hanford. I had no idea. This, why hasn't anybody published this before? Oh my God. You know, I've had people say they were traumatized by reading it. Too bad. I want them to understand, you know, it's, and I'm hoping, I mean, it's just less trauma though, as an individual plaintiff, than I think Yuki could talk about how hard she has a bit about how hard it is to be one of these courageous young people who's facing all that stigma and criticism for being a plaintiff. 
Thank you. Yes. Actually, those seven or six, initially six and now seven, those plaintiffs never shown their faces, never used their real names. And even their testimonies, recorded testimonies, the voice has been changed. And their parents too, when their parents appeared at a press conference, and that was remotely done, so they were appearing in a screen, in computer screen, but that was head below, like the only torso, and the voice changed. So you can kind of imagine the intensity of criticism against them. So therefore, I'm very grateful for those very courageous young people. But at the same time, that shows also their desperation. You know, like they feel like they have to do this now because they might not have much in the future. So that also really hard for me to see. I'm grateful, but at the same time, it's really excruciating. And another reason I really want to emphasize is that actually, you, you know, as Trisha was saying, Hanford's, Hanford's stories, Hanford's testimonies were not known much even in the United States, let alone in Japan. And now Fukushima's restoration plan is modeling, quote unquote, modeling after Hanford. So there is a huge restoration project, which is called Fukushima Innovation Coast Project. And this, and then people there, uh, the government officials, scientists, and those people were sent to Hanford to see how well Hanford is doing. And they are coming back with those triumphant stories. And people in Japan never hear what actually happened in Hanford because the narrative there about Hanford is Hanford overcame this legacy of nuclear contamination. And so that's another reason I really think that this is important for people in Japan to know about. No, I, I totally agree with that, Yuki. It's just really hard to watch our... <laughs> It's, you know, Hanford's one of the most contaminated sites in the Northern Hemisphere. It will never be safe. I mean, you know, it's just like, what? They're portraying it as recovered, you know? Like, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> wow. So if you listeners are like me right now, who, after listening to both of these interviews, are incredibly moved and incredibly frustrated for these people, where can listeners learn more? about what can what needs to be done, what has been done to get a sense of justice for those impacted. Well, you know, Yuki's sites that she mentioned just recently, those are really good information sites. There's a brand new film that's doing the film circuits now. And the person who produced it is down here, UC Santa Cruz, name's Irene Lustig. And the film's called Richland, great name. But what it does is it just has a bunch of people talking about how great Richland is, but I'd never eat any fish from the river. I mean, just the way the people live there is bizarre. And then we got a couple scenes of my cameo is in the, in the um, historic cemetery where there are just rows and rows of baby graves. So they, she's just trying to present both sides of the picture if anybody's interested in knowing about the culture of Richland. I always try to recommend local bookstores rather than online sites. And if you don't see it at your local bookstore, you can request it. It's done very well. It's won a lot of awards, which is great because that means more attention to the topic. But you can also go to the University Press of Kansas website to get it. The Japanese publisher's name is Akashi Shoten, and they have this series, A-K-A, S-H-I, Akashi. Shoten, S-H-O-T-E-N. And they have this great series of human rights issues. So this is one of those human rights issues around the world. And if you go to Akashi Shoten website and you need to actually input, uh, type in the Japanese titles, Moksat Sareta Hibakusha no Koe. But if you do, it shows up. And in that site, you can also watch Trisha's 16-minute video, which is also very informative and also tells us the common threads between 
Penfold Downwinders and Fukushima Downwinders. Very informative video, which I strongly recommend to watch. Yes, I would recommend that as well. It brought me to tears. And if you have not already, please read Trisha's book. It is incredibly moving, incredibly sad, and such a well-needed read for anyone. If you're going to talk about nuclear weapons, we need to read about how they impacted people. Trisha, Yuki, thank you so much for the work you've done to raise awareness on this. And hopefully we can start to create a future that does not keep repeating the cycle. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Alex Hall, Angela Kellett, and Loan Billet, and in San Francisco by Charles Crosby. Audio engineering by Jacqueline Shing. Our theme song is Black Nymph by Peridot. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.